Sciences, and on behalf of the college, I'd like to welcome you to the 2016 MAN lecture. The MAN lecture was inaugurated in 2001, and it's our 15th anniversary of this outstanding event in our college. This lecture series is generously supported by the University of South Alabama Foundation and named for the History Department Funding Chair. Dr. Howard Mann has always been interested in history, education, and we look upon this lecture series as a form of public outreach to the Mobile community. The aim of this lecture is to invite first-rate historians who have studied subjects of broad interest and importance. The subject of each year's lecture alternates between U.S. and non-U.S. topic. This 2016 Howard Mann's lecture will be delivered by Professor David Sorkin of Yale University, and his lecture is entitled The Religious Origins of, Toler of uh, Toleration in Enlightenment Europe. And I would like to ask Ms. Marcy uh, Roberts, Managing Director of the USA Foundation, to give welcoming remarks on behalf of the Foundation. Maxi? Foundation. Uh, we are honored to be able to and have, to have the privilege to support the 15th annual Howard F. Mann Lecture. Um, Betty Brandon is with us at, here, and we're always pleased to see Betty. And uh, many of you had Betty as a student, in, as a professor, rather, and uh, I was fortunate enough, and I think I took every course that she offered at the time. She was such a great professor and continues to be. And Betty and Howard shared many interests and passions. They were involved in supporting and nurturing basic tenets that we often take for granted. Freedom, tolerance, uh, many types of freedom and expressions, uh, freedom of expression. And they, had the, they worked to encourage that in others. And as a part of that, Howard always looked beyond himself and his own beliefs and tried to see the larger picture and tried to understand the view of other individuals. And that spirit and that understanding he translated into leadership of the Department of History, which is inured to the Department of History to the current time under Clarence Moore's leadership. For all of these reasons, for the advocacy of Howard Mann and his life of dedication to tolerance and liberty, Howard Mann, I believe, would have been highly pleased with the lecturer tonight, Dr. Sorkin, and the substance of the lecture we are about to hear. And with that, I would like to introduce Dr. David Miola, Dr. Clarence Moore, okay, not on the program, excuse me, Dr. Clarence Moore, Chair of the History Department, um, for comments. Thank you, Maxie. Uh, I'm Clarence Moore, the Chair of the History Department. I'd just like to welcome all of you. Uh, as, as you just heard, this is our 15th uh, lecture in the Howard Mann series. Uh, I think they have all been very good, and I'm sure this will be uh, one more uh, successful presentation in a, in a line of very distinguished people that we've had here. One of the things that uh, giving this lecture has enabled us to do is to bring to Mobile a lot of people who probably would not otherwise have come here uh, for other reasons, and to give our students uh, the opportunity to hear people who really are at the very top of their fields, uh, people who uh, uh, have held, held many distinguished appointments at many schools, and uh, people who have something to say, something important to say uh, that's really worth listening to. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge Betty's presence, Betty Brandon, uh, who is a not only a real trooper, but um, uh, maybe a starship trooper making these drives from, uh, from uh, North Carolina all the way to here. Uh, and uh, she has been in faithful attendance uh, every year that we, 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 we've had the series. So I uh, welcome each of you, and uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to my colleague, uh, David Miola, who's going to introduce our speaker. Good evening to you. Thank you all for coming out this evening. Um, I'd like to thank both uh, Dean Mears-Vicky and Dr. Moore uh, for being here this evening for their kind introductions, and a special thank you to Maxie Roberts and the USA Foundation for everything they've done. Um, I'd also like to thank all of my colleagues uh, in the history department uh, for making uh, 
this event happen and for helping me and being such a wonderful resource here uh, in Mobile and their wonderful colleagues. And I encourage all of you to go have classes with them. Um, what I, I have the honor here to uh, introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. David Sorkin, uh, who is currently the Lucy G. Moses Professor of Modern Jewish History at Yale University. Uh, having Dr. Sorkin here is uh, quite uh, amazing, and it's really a great sign that our community is supportive of the study and the research in Jewish history, something which uh, I am here to both do and to teach. Uh, he first received his PhD from the University of California at Berkeley in 1983, and he's uh, held positions at several prestigious universities across the world, uh, starting at Brown University and then moving on to the University of Wisconsin at Madison, where he taught for 19 years. Then he moved on there to the Graduate Center at the City University of New York as a distinguished professor, and now up to his current position at Yale. Uh, I've known him for about 10 years. And I first contacted him in the fall of 2006 to discuss becoming his graduate student after I, have, I read his first work, uh, The Transformation of German Jewry, 1760 to 1840, uh, a book which, by the way, won the present tense Joel Kevior Literary Award for History in 1988. Uh, in this work, he proposed that German Jewry created a subculture a part of partially a German Jewish public sphere that was distinctly separate from a German public sphere, yet one that appropriated and interacted with the myriad elements of German culture during German Jewry's process of acculturation and integration. He focused on many of the personalities of the era that were seminal to the development of modern Jewish life. Gabriel Reeser, Bertolt Auerbach, Moses Mendelssohn, and Samson Raphael Hirsch. This work was foundational for a generation of scholars, and it still continues to hold import in the field and also inspire many scholars, even as it is challenged, furthered, amended, and refined. After he wrote Transformation, Dr. Sorkin's work has expanded beyond the purview of German Jewish history. In 2008, he published The Religious Enlightenment, Protestants, Jews, and Catholics from London to Vienna, which crosses confessional divisions to show how six different thinkers in different countries engaged their religion, developed con conceptions of toleration, engaged with the burgeoning public sphere and society writ large, and also interacted with the state. His work also looks to deparochialize Jewish history and place it along mainstream history, something that I still believe needs to happen today. Ulrich Lehner, who's a professor of history at Marquette University, wrote in 2012, Quote, the importance of this book for religious studies and intellectual history cannot be overestimated. It has already become a classic in Enlightenment studies and should be on the reading list of every religion scholar as well, end quote. His current project, which he spoke about earlier today, also deals with broader themes and builds on a scholarship over the past few decades. He looks at the long durée of Jewish emancipation, the process by which Jews acquired rights and integration over nearly half a millennium. He has recently published three pr preliminary studies about this project, which he calls Interminable, Eman Interminable Emancipation, European Jews in the Search for Equality, 1550 to 2000. Over the past three decades, Dr. Sorgan has been and continues to be one of the most influential thinkers in religious and Jewish history. And it is an honor to have him here with us tonight. His talk is entitled The Religious Origins of Toleration in Enlightenment Europe. Please join me in welcoming Dr. David Sorkin to Mobile and to the University of South Alabama. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, David, for that very kind introduction. Um, good evening. It's a pleasure and an honor to have been invited to deliver the um, Howard Mayen Lecture. I'd like to thank Professor Moore, Chair of the History Department, for the invitation, and David Miola. Um, for all the arrangements uh, as well. Now my topic, the religious origin of toleration in Enlightenment Europe, uh, and the topic of toleration, I would like to contend, is not academic, though it's also that. All of the discussion in the newspapers, talk shows, and in Washington, D.C., about immigration, whether from Mexico and Central and Latin America to the United States, or from Syria or the Middle East to Europe, 
is actually about toleration. Toleration means, are we willing to accept into our society people who are fundamentally different from us, that is, who speak a different language, practice a different religion, have a different experience of politics and culture, or are members of different ethnic and national groups. Put in those terms, toleration has been a central issue in Europe since the 16th century. From the 16th to the 18th centuries, from the Reformation to the Enlightenment, it was a question of tolerating members of other faiths. In the 19th and 20th centuries, it was a question of tolerating members of other nationalities or, more ominously, races. In the 21st century, it is once again becoming a question of tolerating members of other, uh, becoming a question of religion as well as nationality or race. This evening, I want to explore the origins of the concept of toleration in Europe, especially in the 17th and 18th centuries. I want to do so because there are widespread misconceptions. The conventional story of toleration is that it emerged from the Reformation and was the creation of Protestant thinkers, especially in Holland and England, and of secular Enlightenment thinkers or philosophes in France who opposed the oppressive policies of the Catholic Church. I want to propose a different genealogy. All of Europe's religions had to learn to be tolerant, and there were thinkers of all the faiths, Protestants, Jews, and Catholics, who endeavored to articulate arguments for toleration. This endeavor resulted not from the Reformation, but from the deadlock at the end of the religious wars following the Reformation. The Reformation had unleashed a period of unprecedented bloodshed and destruction not just from Catholics fighting Protestants, but also from Protestants fighting each other. At the end of the wars of religion in some of the German states, for example, travelers found where there had once been thriving towns only wolves. Central Europe may have lost as much as one-third of its population during those religious wars. As the French writer Montesquieu has one of his travelers say in his satirical Persian letters of 1721, quote, I can assure you that no kingdom has ever had as many civil wars as the kingdom of Christ. Or as Voltaire put it in his Sermon of the Fifty, written between 1750 and 1752, that Christian religion, which has been the source of so many quarrels, of civil wars and crimes, which has spilled so much blood, and which is divided into so many hostile sects in the corners of the world where it reigns. After a century of such destruction, European leaders signed a treaty in 1648 known as the, Pe the Peace of Westphalia. This was a landmark. For the first time, an international treaty recognized the existence of three religions, Catholics, Catholicism, Lutheranism, and Calvinism. The treaty also recognized the existence of multi-confessional polities, states with mixed religious populations, states that had a ruler of one faith and population of another faith, etc. But the treaty also legislated different levels of religious observance. And now here's a major point about toleration. Toleration emphatically, emphatically, does not mean equality. As the German writer Goethe once put it, to tolerate is to despise. Toleration means grudging acceptance of difference and the practice of inequality or unequal privileges. The Peace of Westphalia of 1848 formalized that inequality in stipulating three different levels of religious observance. This was a way of making a multi-religious or multi-confessional society possible, 
by recognizing differences in status and power. The highest level of religious observance was called public observance. In public observance, you could have an ecclesiastical building, a church, a synagogue, or a mosque, in a visible public space, meaning to say in the village or town square, or in a city on an avenue or a boulevard. That church could have spires and it could have bells. And the priest or the pastor could conduct public processions. The second level of religious observance was private, called private observance. You could have an ecclesiastical building, a church or a synagogue, but not one that was publicly visible. It could be built on a little lane or an alley or in a courtyard behind apartment buildings and other buildings so that it wasn't publicly visible. It also meant no spires, no bells, and no public processions. Finally, the lowest level of, of observance was called domestic observance, which meant that a small group of people could congregate in a member's home. Now, obviously, the state religion or the established religion would have public observance, while dissenting religions would be accorded either private or domestic observance. The virtue of this arrangement was obvious. Here was a practice of toleration of inequality of observance that aimed to avoid conflict and bloodshed. For conflicts over religion tended then and now to emerge over public displays of religion. Processions, parades, crowds in the street, funerals. Think, for example, or the, the example that comes to my, to my mind uh, is the Orange Parade of July 12th in Northern Ireland, when Protestants march deliberately through Catholic areas. These three levels created a system designed to avoid such public conflict. But there were other forms of practicing toleration as well as the, in the 16th to the 18th centuries that aimed to avoid public displays. One of them had a German name. It was called Auslauf, meaning to say going out or going beyond. And what it meant was going beyond the boundaries of a town or a city in order to worship, meaning leaving the public space of the city to worship in another jurisdiction. That practice was actually written into the Peace of Westphalia. To give you an example, in the 1570s and 1580s during the Reformation, Vienna was a re-Catholicizing city. It had been a Catholic city. Much of the gentry had become Protestant. The Habsburg government was trying to re-Catholicize it during the so-called Counter-Reformation. In so doing, it prohibited Protestant worship. What did Protestants do? A group of Protestant nobles bought an estate with a castle called Her Her Hernals a mile or so beyond Vienna's walls. They turned it into a church. And on Sundays, Protestants would leave the city of Vienna and march to Hernals, the castle of Hernals, in order to worship. And this practice lasted for some 40 years. Or to take another example, the Edict of Nantes in 1598 put an end to the religious wars in France by creating a system of toleration for Protestants in particular cities and particular places. Protestants in Catholic towns were allowed to worship beyond the city limits in the suburbs. And indeed, on Sundays, Protestants would leave the town, would leave its public space, and go and, and, and worship in a chapel in a suburb. Another such practice was called that of the clandestine church, or the schoolkirk. Here's an example of that. In Amsterdam, Protestants who were triumphant in the, in the Dutch Republic in, six, in the 16th century prohibited Catholic worship. 
What did Catholics do? Beginning in the 1660s, they built a church called Our Lord in the Attic. From the outside, from the facade, all you saw were three apartment buildings. They looked no different than any of the other apartment buildings in the neighborhood. Inside was a church seating 150 that extended through the attics of three adjacent buildings. The door to the church was from an alley, not from the public street. And the Catholics knew not to congregate in groups, either going to worship or coming from worship. It was a, a clandestine church which everyone knew about, but it wasn't public. To repeat, here were forms of toleration, of legislated and agreed upon inequality that made possible a multi-religious society. I'd now like to shift from practices of toleration to theories of toleration in order to show how religious thinkers in the 17th and 18th centuries began to argue for toleration in a new way. They began to champion toleration not as a privilege that a ruler granted or that was reached through negotiations, but rather toleration as an inherent right. Now, the history that is familiar to most of us, because it bears on the origins of the Declaration of Independence and the American Constitution, is that 18th century thinkers, particularly Enlightenment thinkers, articulated a contract theory of society, namely that individuals voluntarily banded together to gain security for themselves and their property, right? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yet in the 18th century, 17th and 18th centuries, there was another form of contract theory, one that's been terribly neglected, that individuals freely band together to create religious societies so that they can worship with like-minded people. In this view, the church, like society itself, is a voluntary society. In fact, one finds both theories in some of the same thinkers. Take John Locke, who is one of the, greatest ex the great exponents of contract theory in his two treatises on government. Well, look at his letter of toleration from 1689 in which he argues that the church is a voluntary society. I quote, A church then I take to be a voluntary society of men, joining themselves together of their own accord in order to the public worshiping of God in such a manner as they judge acceptable to him and effectual to the salvation of their souls. This theory of the church or the synagogue as a voluntary society, was known in the 18th, 17th and 18th centuries as collegialism, a collegium being an assembly or college of individuals. Like contract theory, the contract theory of society, collegialism presupposed the sovereign individual. In contract theory, the individual was sovereign in political life, as a political and social being. In collegial theory, the individual was sovereign as a believer, as a religious being. Collegial theory, in fact, became the basis for religious thinkers to advocate toleration as an inherent right. It be collegialism became the shared idiom of Protestants, Catholics, and Jews trying to promote toleration in the 18th century. Let me take three examples of religious thinkers who promoted toleration using collegial theory. Um, and I take examples not from England or Holland, but from uh, Central Europe, from German-speaking Central Europe. The first example is Sigmund Jakob Baumgarten, 
who lived from 1706 to 1757. He was a professor of theology at the University of Halle, which in the 18th century was the foremost university in Prussia. Now, the Prussia in which Baumgarten lived, and you may find this surprising, was an exemplary multi-confessional state. Prussia was actually at the forefront of, to of practicing toleration. The ruler of Prussia was Calvinist. The majority of the population was Lutheran. And the rulers invited in Jews who had been expelled from Vienna in 1870. They invited in Huguenots who had been expelled from France in 1685 at the time of the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. And in 1740, when Prussia seized the province of Silesia from the Habsburg Empire, it gained a significant Catholic population as well. Like Locke, Baumgarten argued that individuals were the church's building blocks. Quote, divine worship societies emerge from the connection of individual persons to a common divine service. So for Baumgarten, the church is a voluntary society. And he endorsed toleration as being indispensable to the state. The government cannot force anyone to accept or renounce a religious confession. So freedom of religion and conscience. Moreover, for Baumgarten, citizenship did not require a particular confession. Members of different confessions could be upstanding and productive subjects. I quote, one cannot be a Christian without being an honorable man and a good citizen or a true subject. Nevertheless, the latter is possible without the former, so that someone can be honorable and a good citizen without being a Christian. Now, what did this mean in practice? In 1752-53, Baumgarten wrote an opinion on a case that further demonstrated his fundamental commitment to Jewish to to toleration. And this is a, an extraordinarily interesting case. When I came across this in the collection of his theological opinions, I, I was just blown away. I couldn't believe what I had read. I thought, okay, my German is good, but I've misunderstood this. So I read it a second time. And I still didn't believe it. And I read it a third time. But I'd been right the first time. <laughs> a Jewish father of four children had converted to Christianity. Did his conversion require that he divorce his wife? If so, who should have custody of the children? And in which religion should the children be raised? Baumgarten asserted that the husband should divorce his wife, respecting her rights by neither infringing on her property nor permitting her remarriage. And that she wanted to remain Jewish, that's fine. He had to divorce her if she chose to remarry. That's fine, too. And the property that had come to him with her dowry, her marriage dowry, should be returned to her. In implementing these procedures, the civil authority must be careful to avoid, Baumgarten said, coercion of conscience. Now, what about the children? Baumgarten argued against taking the children from the mother and raising them as Christians. Instead, the father should raise them in both religions so that when they reached maturity, they could choose a religion on their own. This arrangement alone respected the children's inherent or natural rights. In offering this solution, Baumgarten recognized the privileges of the majority faith. Quote, a tolerated religion does not enjoy equal privileges with the ruling religion, right? You have public observance, private observance, domestic observance. They're not all equal. They are tolerated, however. Yet he was also sensitive to the minority religion's precarious position. In France, for example, laws dictated that in a cross-confessional marriage, if the father was Catholic, meaning a Catholic father and a Protestant mother, the children were automatically raised Catholic. They were raised in the majority faith. 
Baumgarten was mindful of the situation of Protestants in Catholic countries, and he also wrote about the situation of Christians under Muslim rule. Our second thinker is Moses Mendelssohn, who lived from 1729 to 1786, who also lived in Prussia, particularly, especially in Berlin, and who was a Jew. Mendelssohn was a major figure of both the Berlin Enlightenment, uh, he, he wrote books on uh, aesthetics, metaphysics, he won a prize given by the Prussian Royal Academy uh, in which someone we've never heard of before uh, won second prize, that was Immanuel Kant, Mendelssohn won first prize. Uh, and he was also a major figure of the Jewish Enlightenment or the Haskalah. Uh, who wrote major works in Hebrew throughout his career, his magnum opus uh, being a, uh, a three-part work, a, trans a translation of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, into High German, though printed in Hebrew letters, with a commentary on the Bible in Hebrew, and a general introduction in Hebrew for the 18th century Jewish reader. Mendelssohn was also a successful businessman. He, ran a silk, he was a silk manufacturer whom the state consulted about the silk industry. Using collegial theory, Mendelssohn argued that the state had no power over beliefs. There should be no state coercion of beliefs whatsoever. The state must declare itself indifferent to belief in order to tolerate all religions. As long as subjects showed, show, showed themselves to be loyal and trustworthy, and for Mendelssohn that meant they had to believe in God, they had to believe in providence, and they had to believe in the immortality of the soul, because if you had a God, if you had providence watching over the individual, and the soul were immortal and you got just desserts in the future life, that was a guarantee that you were going to be moral. So Mendelssohn said that the state must declare itself indifferent to belief, exercise no coercion, and he also declared that religion was to have no powers of coercion since its members, since religion was a voluntary society in which its members voluntarily banded together to worship. The only thing a religious society could do, a church or a synagogue, was to expel someone who did something inappropriate, who displayed immoral behavior, who stood up in the middle of the worship service and said, I won't say that prayer, it's wrong. That voluntary, that society of the church has the right to expel that person, but without any consequences for the person's civil life. The third and last example I want to look at uh, is a figure named Joseph Eibel, a Catholic in the Habsburg Empire who lived from 1741 to 1805. Eibel was first a professor of canon law in Vienna and then a civil servant in the Habsburg lands. Eibel used collegial theory to support and implement Joseph II's edicts of toleration uh, which were a landmark for Catholic rulers. Joseph II paved the way for toleration in the, Catholic, in the Catholic lands of Europe. In 1781, he issued an edict of toleration recognizing the rights of Protestants and the Greek Orthodox in the Catholic Habsburg Empire. Uh, for the first time, they actually had legal standing. And what that meant, and was especially important, is legal standing meant that they could have legitimate marriages. Their marriages would be recognized by the state. Because until that, until that point, Protestant marriages were illegitimate marriages, and the children were illegitimate, which had severe consequences. Because if the children are illegitimate, and the parents die, and their Catholic relatives the Protestant children have no claim to the property and the inheritance, and Catholic relatives could claim it. This was also a problem in France. So when Joseph II extended toleration, he gave Protestants and the Greek Orthodox in the Habsburg Empire 
civil standing and the right to private and in some cases only domestic worship. Public worship was reserved for the Catholic Church. That was the Edict of 1781. Beginning in 1782, he issued a series of edicts for Jews in various parts of the Habsburg Empire uh, in which um, he opened the, school, the public schools to Jews, opened all occupations to them, um, and encouraged them to use the German language uh, for all for administrative purposes. Eibel advocated toleration on the basis of the distinction between the respective spheres of church and state, just like Mendelssohn. The church aims to realize man's internal happiness or salvation. The state pursues man's external happiness or well-being. The church's authority and means are entirely spiritual. It neither needs nor should use other forms of power. It can, quote, instruct, request, admonish. It can, quote, offer holy love, steadfast patience, and insurmountable trust in God. It cannot engage in coercion. Toleration is not only in the state's best interest, since it prevents the loss of valuable subjects. Eibel understood the teaching of toleration to be an absolute necessity of Catholic pastoral care. Toleration belonged to being a good Catholic. Quote, intolerance is contrary to natural law, civic duties, the gospel, original church discipline, the examples of moral Christians. In consequence, intolerance is contrary to God, love of fellow man, and humaneness and detrimental to religion and all human and civic society. Eibel recognized that social harmony required toleration and proper instruction could inculcate it. Te quote, history teaches us that the majority of disorders, disturbances, and devastations of entire regions, he's thinking here about the wars of religion, result not from toleration, but from intolerance. If there have also frequently been those sorts of disorders in tolerant lands, so the cause of these has been that despite the sovereign's toleration, the subjects and pastors of different religions have provoked each other and fed mutual hatred. This will all be improved by a better instruction, a well-chosen clergy, an alert sovereign, and the daily improvements in thought that come with the Enlightenment. In conclusion, it is time to reject the narrative that the Reformation and Enlightenment created toleration. Rather, toleration emerged from the religious deadlock following the wars of religion and the unavoidable necessity of erecting multi-confessional polities. Toleration first emerged as a practice, the Peace of Westphalia's three levels of religious observance, and such practices as going out or beyond the border, Auslauf, and the clandestine church. 18th century thinkers, Protestants, Catholics, and Jews, then used collegial theory, the idea of the church as a voluntary society, which paralleled that of society, of, of the contract theory of society, to advocate toleration as a right of the sovereign individual. That theory, collegial theory, long neglected, has great relevance for us today. Thank you. My pleasure. Yes, in the back. 
magisterial reformers, and radical reformers. Yes. Uh, and it, it just struck me uh, that uh, and I was I was wondering was there an influence here? Uh, do you think on on your your perspective and your timeline of history? Because uh, I just was curious since we were a month and a half after. Well, I'm, I'm discussing from 1579. Right. Luther's written his thesis on through with Calvin and the and this the Reformation. Right. Right, right. What kind of influence would you say the church, the church, the, the Christian model had upon uh, your thesis here uh, in terms of toleration? Because clearly the radicals were looking for separation of church and state. The magisterials were clearly saying the state would dictate what the religion is. Right. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, okay. D does everyone? L l let me repeat the question as I understand it, and I'll and I'll un I'll ask answer the question I understand. It may be different from the question you asked. <laughs> um, th the question is: Did major thinkers of the Reformation, Calvin, Luther, uh, Luther, Calvin, etc., and then of the later the Second Reformation, as you could call it, right? Uh, of the radical sects have an influence on the thinkers that I'm talking about in the 18th century. Uh, they definitely did, though their influence tended to be negative. Okay, the thinkers I'm talking about, by and large, were rejecting the example of Luther and Calvin. Calvin, after all, persecuted Servetus, right? And it was, it was Calvin's persecution of Servetus which led to which led Castellio to write one of the first major tracts on toleration, in which he said, you know, uh, uh, oh, it's this famous quote, and I'm, I, I'm going to get it. I'm, in, in which he said, murdering a man is murdering a man. It is not murdering a doctrine. Right? That's what he said about Servetus. Now it's also true, now wait a minute, it's also true about the Christian radicals. Look at the Puritans when they came to power in England, right? Cromwell persecuted the Irish in a way that the Anglicans never had. He was the most cruel occupier of Ireland, right? So the, the, the Reformation, I, I, I'm sorry to say, right, and this is no, 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 no slur on Protestantism or the Protestant fathers, but the Reformation did not promote toleration. If you read more, mo the most recent historians, they will argue that the Reformation led to a period of virtually unprecedented intolerance and bloodshed. Okay? Now, right. Uh, so, so what, 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 what the thinkers I'm, I, 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 I've dealt with and I discussed this evening were trying to do is that they were trying, they, they, they weren't aiming for a separation of church and state as we understand it in the United States, right? Mendelssohn, for example, said the church and state, the, 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 you know, the, church, the state should have no power over religion and religion should only admonish and teach, etc., etc. But his understanding was is that religious clergy should be paid by the state. So it's not separation of church and state as we understand it. Pufendorf. Samuel Pufendorf, who was one of the great exponents of toleration in Protestant Central Europe, like Mendelssohn, wanted the clergy to be paid by the state. And he was an advocate of toleration, but writing at the, at the same time as Locke in the 1690s, and he actually wrote before Locke, 
he thought toleration was still a privilege granted by the ruler, right? The, the problem in post-Reformation Europe uh, is that all of the religious sects, all of the confessions which had power were capable and indeed engaged in perse religious persecution, right? The Catholic Church did it, you had the Inquisition, Protestant churches did it, they did it not just Lutherans against Calvinists, but you know, the Lutheran churches in Germany in the 17th and 18th century persecuted the Pietists, you know, who were good Lutherans who were trying to return in their, in their eyes to the message of Luther, which had sort of been lost in the Lutheran church as it had gained power and prestige and wealth, and they organized conventicles, they organized their own prayer circles which were extremely significant at the time, first of all because they, because women were equal members of those conventicles. And those conventicles crossed corporation or estate, corporate or estate lines in which nobles and commoners worshiped together for the first time and discussed the Bible together for the first time, right? And where the Lutheran church, the Orthodox church, had the power, it persecuted the pietists. So all of the churches engaged in persecution. Okay, I mean, what, what, what we have to see about toleration is that toleration, even coming after the Peace of Westphalia, even after you have these various practices of toleration, toleration is still a practice which people are engaging in in the face of overwhelming persecution by religions. By, okay? Now, what you have to say about, um, I'm not going to talk about the, I'm not an expert on the Middle East. Uh, and on, certainly not on Islam, but I do want to say one thing. All of the groups in the Middle East, all of the Muslim groups in the Middle East, today talk about rebuilding the caliphate, right? Now, if you look at the history, where does that come from? In 19, I think it's 1921 or 1922, the secular rulers of Turkey, who were the heirs of the Ottoman Empire, which had considered itself to be the caliphate, declared the caliphate to be dead, over, fini. Within a year or two, the Muslim Brotherhood was founded with the express purpose of rebuilding the caliphate. That's where it comes from. There was a, a, a political vacuum which the secular states didn't want to deal with. Okay? Another question. Any other questions? I'm sorry if I didn't want to be too tough on you. Please. <laughs> oh yes, yes, yes. No question. Uh, to what extent? What's the connection between the Edict of Nantes and the Treaty of Westphalia? It sounds. I think the edict is previous, is it not? Yes. Uh, it sounds to me as all those different arrangements in different parts of France, it sounds like perhaps the origin of those three levels of uh, acceptance. Is, is that so? Well, I'm not sure that the three levels come from the Edict of Nantes. The, edict of, uh, the question is what's the relationship between the Edict of Nantes and the Peace of Westphalia, okay? Uh, just to give you the historical background, uh, France had its own version of civil war over religion in the 16th century. The Edict of Nantes in 1598 put an end to those civil war, to the civil war between Protestants and Catholics by allowing Protestants to live in certain parts of France, particularly in the south where they were concentrated. They were even able to maintain their private armies in certain places and where Protestants were in the minority, they were allowed to worship using that, for example, that practice of Auslauf, of going to the suburbs that I talked about. The practice, the Edict did not went into effect in 1598. It was never seen as a permanent treaty. It was a temporary treaty in which it was stated in the treaty itself that ultimately the French state hoped that the so, what, what is it, the so-called, 
the so-called reform, the so-called reformed would in fact return to the Catholic Church. Now what the, what the French state does in the, in the period after 1598 is to slowly whittle away at, at, the, at, the, at the provisions of the Edict of Nantes, first sort of demilitarizing the Protestants so that the, the, and, and whittling away at, especially at the Protestant nobility, right, because in, a, in France in the 16th and 17th centuries where the power lay was with the nobility or with the state. If you could deprive the Protestant nobility of their power, you could, you could destroy the movement. The same thing happened in England where the, the, the English state uh, tried to undermine the power of the Catholic gentry who were the basis of Catholic life as a minority once in England after the Reformation.